Welcome to the webinar between the line between the lines by sponsored by INSEAD Lifelong Learning. It's with great pleasure to welcome Felix Oberholzer G. Thank you so much, Felix, for, for joining. Um, Felix is the Andreas Andresen Professor um, at Harvard Business School. He's part of the strategy unit. Um, Look, I had I have a few friends at Harvard Business Schools. I just spent the last week there at the Mike um, at the Mike Tushman Memorial Conference, and I actually used the opportunity to do a little bit of background research. And the first sentence you always <laughs> hear, in particular from from Harvard Business School faculty members, is "Oh, Felix is simply the best." So that is typically um, well. this is typically the way how it how it starts off. I can provide you the names afterwards, Felix. Um, Felix is. Um, is highly, highly accomplished in research as well as in teaching. He has the rare kind of accomplishment, but not so rare on this podcast, that he's highly, highly appreciated by researchers. He has published in the very best econ journals like the Econom American Economy Review, the Journal of Political Economy, but he's also highly read by practitioners. His Harvard Business Review articles are rightly read. His book has been a bestseller. Um, my personal kind of favorite of what Felix has done is I'm an addict of Felix um, TED podcast after hours. I've listened mm -hmm. to every single episode to many of them multiple times. I think it's absolutely excellent. Um, it's very much current, but if you haven't listened to it, I highly, highly recommend you actually download kind of old episodes and um, what they do about the restaurant kind of industry and stuff. This is absolutely fantastic. It's also incredibly joyful. Um, as you listen to it, you also learn a lot about Felix, how Felix is much more comfortable to promote other people's books than his own books. You actually learn about his kind of desire or kind of joy in cooking as well as in eating, about his kind of travel adventures. So it's wonderful, actually. Um, you can learn more about Felix, and I highly recommend that you should learn a little bit more about Felix. Um, let me talk about let me talk about the book itself. Um, the book is simply better, simpler strategy. Um, the book is um, Felix. I, I will ask you about this in a minute, but it basically kind of suggests a different way of thinking about strategy. A diagnosis is an important problem by saying, like, look. Many firms claim that they have a strategy, but in many ways, they might actually not have a strategy. They may have something what they call a strategy, but it might not be, it might almost be overcomplicated, sometimes too simple. Um, the book is a joyful read. I have this personal kind of metric, how I kind of how I kind of judge management books. And it's very often how many of the anecdotes do I actually already know? To what degree is there talk about the airplanes? that don't come back by wall. To what degree is 3M featured? <laughs> and in Felix, in the, the case of Better Simpler Strategy, it has been a huge joy. There was, I don't think there was a single anecdote I knew before. They're true, it's, the book is truly global. Um, you read a lot about American, European, Asian examples. Felix is also responsible for the China program at Harvard Business School. So it's absolutely fantastic. You learn about different parts of the world. Um, Felix, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the book. Thank you for having me, Henning, I, I, and thank you for the very nice introduction. I feel I'm in a little trouble already, uh, but uh, we'll see. We'll see where this goes. Wonderful, Felix. What motivated the book? So, I uh, part of my teaching uh, assignments here at Harvard Business School has been a mid-career executive program, and one of the things that struck me, really surprised me at the at the very beginning, was that. These are highly accomplished professionals. They have, you know, deep expertise in finance or marketing, like really amazing careers. And then when it comes to strategy, these highly accomplished people had a hard time explaining what it is, how it is helpful, why we do it, what we should expect or not expect from strategy. And so for many years while I was teaching it, I was trying to look for a way to make a topic that can sometimes be a little mystical even, uh, make a topic easy to understand so that you can go home to your organization and really make a difference by thinking strategically about the business that they have and maybe even being responsible or at least being a part of the strategic planning process. That was the ambition. But it's, it's interesting to me because when marketers meet, they don't have to 
talk about what is marketing or when accountants meet, they don't have to, you know, they'll talk about the finer points of accounting, but they don't have to talk about what is accounting when strategists meet. It's like, some, oh, what is strategy in the first place? How is it helpful? And so on and so on. We have all of these questions. And in part, I hope the book is an answer to at least some of these questions. Felix, why is that? I mean, it's a, a, to a certain degree, that answer doesn't matter for the book, but why is that? Why do you think are people so confused about what strategy is? I think it, the way it's it lives in different organizations is is very is very different, right? So unlike, say, in accounting, where you have lots of rules, lots of regulations, there's no there's no equivalent process. Uh, that says you have to do strategy in a particular way. And then it's really everything from glorified budgeting, like companies like say, oh, we have a strategy process. And then when you look a little closer, it's like, oh, that's what most people will call budgeting, not really the idea of strategy. And then I think maybe more interesting is the financialization of management in many ways, I think, has been a good thing so that we you know, measure companies by how well they do financially. It's also had the effect that everything else that doesn't show up in financial numbers is now a little bit put to the side. And some of that I think is okay because it's not that important. Some of it is also sometimes everybody knows finance, everybody knows strategy. So sometimes when you don't really know a business all that well, I can always talk about the finances of the business. But the heart of strategy, this idea that I create value for someone else, I create value for customers, I create value for people in my organization, that is not what you see on a profit and loss statement. And so to the extent that companies are so focused on financials, everything that really matters in strategy is now, if it's at all visible, it's indirectly visible in that you have recurring revenue or that you have very loyal customers or that you don't have much churn among employees, but you don't see it when you start thinking about strategy, looking at the financials, you're doing it exactly wrong. Let's dive into this notion of value, which is obviously the, the central concept in the book. And just one note, um, people can answer questions and we will try later on the very best to kind of answer all of these. So if you have questions, um, please feel free to type them all. Um, into the Q&A, and you can also upvote them or comment on others' questions. Um, Felix, you have this one example in the book, which I just find so incredibly beautiful. And so I, so I would like to start with this, and maybe we can then unpack from that what value is. And it's very often people kind of draw on personal experiences, and very often it doesn't work very well. In your case, it's absolutely beautiful. You have this example where you order flowers. And maybe yes. maybe you can describe the anecdote, what happened, and and then we can start from there and unpack this idea of value creation. Yeah. So uh, I should maybe say before I tell the story, one reason why I like it is it illustrates that if companies adopt this ethos of value creation. So if everything you do is ultimately measured against, does it create value? Does it not create value? What you typically see is then lots of activities, lots of things that happen in the organization. And maybe the CEO doesn't even really know that all of these things happen, but it's, but it's aligned in the sense that you get all of these value creating ideas. And the story is, I live on the East Coast of the United States and I have a friend who lives in Los Angeles and I send her flowers for her birthday every year. And then this is a couple of years back, I forgot, like somehow, you know, her day came and went and I didn't send the flowers. Uh, I noticed about a week later, oh my God, it was her birthday and I didn't send the flowers. So pick up the phone, I call a flower store in LA and uh, it's late afternoon. And so the salesperson asks, should we deliver the flowers today or is it good enough if we do it tomorrow? And I say, you know, it's a little embarrassing. I forgot my friend's birthday. It would be really great if you could deliver the flowers as quickly as possible. And she asks, much to my surprise, should we take the blame? Should we say that we are at fault for not having delivered the flowers? And what it reminded me is that this person is not in the business of selling flowers. This person is in the business of thinking about value for her customers. Felix, say a 
why is this concept of value so central? And you've already alluded to this, that that once you think about value, you, you start seeing all kinds of opportunities you might not see when you focus more narrowly, be it on profit or shareholder value or... Yeah, so the, the the basic idea is, of course, we want our organizations to be successful. We want them to be financially successful, but we want to do this in a way that is smart. So we ask, where do really generous margins come from? How is it that I can charge a premium price? Or how is it that I don't have to pay at the top of the scale and I still get really talented people who join my organization? And the answer in both of these cases is, you have created value in the customer case, you have increased willingness to pay for the people or the organizations that purchase your products and services. Or in the case of the employees, you have created something that is valuable to people in the organization, but it's different from compensation. And when I started this research by, by looking at what is special about these companies that have enduring success. As you, as you know, Henning, it's very, it's very popular now to say, oh, strategic planning is dead and everything changes so quickly. And, you know, you have to move from week to week. There's no long term. There's no notion of long term success. And then you look at the data and that is definitely not true. Uh, I mean, it's not true for many well-known examples like Microsoft, but it's also not true for many examples, many companies that I've looked at that have quite mundane businesses. So here in the US, there's this business called Auto, AutoZone. So it's say if your brake light um, uh, no longer works, you go to AutoZone and you pick up a brake light. That's, you would think, oh my God, that's like the most boring business. How on earth? This is incredibly profitable. And so it's both these really exciting companies that we talk about all the time. And it's also companies that we, that you and I might think they're, they're rather mundane, not that, not that interesting. But when you look at how is it that they have such stellar results over and over, it's the same story. They have found ways to increase willingness to pay for their customers, or they have found ways to lower willingness to sell off their employees, creating more attractive working conditions. And frankly, when, I, when I'm when i totally honest, when I started this research, I thought, oh, maybe I discover something really unusual. You know, some, something that no one else has seen before. I don't know, maybe it's all about the charisma of the CEO or what, whatever. And I was almost a little disappointed. It's like, oh, time after time after time. It's really just these two things. Strategy, I have come to say very often, uh, it's just a plan to create value. And, and the way you can do it, the levers you have for value creation is not, is not a list with 122 items on it. Uh, that would be completely unhelpful and useless because in everybody's life, we have too many lists with too many items on them in the first place. It's just a few levers to drive willingness to pay. And it's a few levers to drive willingness to sell. And that's essentially it. You see, one, one aspect I really like about the book in that sense is that that you make very clear that there is no such a list, that people need to be very thoughtful about when which kind of strategy works, right? You see, like I, I found this most salient in your discussion of network effects, where, where you're kind of talking about, look, Apple had to sell the apps basically at a low price, but then for Hewlett Packard, it actually made sense to pay the cartridge, to sell the cartridges at a high price. Um, Let's go a little bit to, to make sure that the people who haven't read the book kind of can follow. There are these two central concepts, the willingness to pay and the willingness to sell in this kind of idea of value creation. Can you say a little bit about both of these concepts and how they feature in the process of value creation? Yeah. So uh, it's essentially a way to measure how much value you create for a particular group of customers or for a particular group of employees. And I think the easiest way to see it is think about a company that you, you buy their products and they start raising the price and they raise the price and you buy and they raise the price and you buy. And at some point in time, you look at the price and you go, oh, my God, now too much. That is your willingness to pay. It's the maximum that you would ever pay for a product or a service. And then this exact same idea 
in the employee relationship. So say I look at your compensation right now and I start cutting your compensation. I pay you a little less, I pay you a little less, I pay you a little less. And at some point in time you say, oh, now not enough money. I'm no longer interested in working at this place. That is the person's willingness to sell. And of course, if the work is amazing, intrinsically interesting, fascinating, the kind of thing that you always wanted to do, your willingness to sell will be fairly low. Uh, if the work is risky, maybe dangerous, maybe it's not really, you don't really have your heart in it, then your willingness to sell will be relatively higher. What's interesting about these two things is that I don't think I can tell anyone anything that they don't already know about willingness to pay. It's so intuitive to us. Like we think about it all the time. Customers interest, like I don't really meet companies that are clueless about customers willingness to pay. Customers intricity is everywhere. And then at the same time, this, this exact same notion in the employee relationship, often people don't quite know, oh, is it, is it a plan to underpay people? No, 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 it's a plan to create more value for people, but we don't do it with the help of money. We do it in lots of other ways, just like we're doing lots of great things for our customers. So even though there's perfect symmetry between the two ideas, and I usually illustrate them using something called a value stick, where you have willingness to pay at the top, and then you have willingness to sell at the bottom, but we have so much facility thinking about willingness to pay and willingness to sell is this strange creature that we don't talk about, don't think about. But in many ways, in particular, given where the economy is right now and then thinking about low fertility rates and competition for talent, I am completely convinced that the source of competitive advantage that will matter most in the future is willingness to sell and not willingness to pay is you have this very interesting observation that I'd never thought about it, but I was really fascinated by it. You, you kind of conclude the parts on willingness to pay, and then you come in the book to willingness to sell. And, and you start with the employees and you're basically having this, when you ask people in, what are they willing to pay for employees? They say like, oh, we pay market. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> yes. that, so that they basically everybody is concerned about product differentiation but the moment we talk about jobs we basically treat them as a total commodity right it's yeah. like oh we pay the same as basically the market and um, what why is that felix why why do you think is it that that people treat in an odd way you see like it's not that people don't appreciate their employees that's not what you're saying but yeah. but they don't they don't differentiate. They don't try to offer something particular. Yeah. yeah. Uh, frankly, I don't know. It's it's very it's very puzzling because if if you had someone say in sales or someone in R and D and the person would say, oh, let's develop a set of products or services that are exactly identical to what everybody else has, <laughs> that person probably wouldn't be very long in his or her job because that's insane. You should never do that. But when on the on the employee side, you know, we discover purpose matters before you know it. Everybody does purpose. DEI matters before you know it. Everybody does DEI. We try to pay market. There's this very strong push towards not really leaning out the window, not doing something that is clearly differentiated from everybody else. In my uh, executive, in some of my executive education classes, I do, I have a funny assignment where um, I display everyone's purpose statement, like all the participants in the course, and I, I show that their purpose statement, and I have them pick theirs. And of course, <laughs> they can't, right? Because it, maybe you have never really paid that much attention to purpose, but even if you did, like all of these statements look so incredibly similar. It's like just really hard to know, or say, ask anyone in HR, what's your culture like? That description is the same description that you heard a million times. I, much of my academic research now has to do with trying to uncover why exactly this is. Because what I see, I mean, you look at this is data for the United States. I don't know if it's true everywhere, but 60% of people who leave their job in the US say, I leave because of my manager. It is not possible that all of these managers don't know how to manage people. 
must be that we make it really, really difficult for them. And we make it difficult for them because we don't have a clear value proposition. When you apply for a job, you have the vaguest of senses what it's going to be like at that particular company. The companies have reputation somehow, but what do you really know day in, day out? And as a result, uh, because we don't have a clearly articulated value proposition, unlike what we do for customers, where we're very good at letting customers know which of the products, which of the services they should buy because they're right for them. We don't really do that for employees. And then if I manage a team, Everybody on my team has very different expectations. It is, it is a, a, such a hard job to do, in part because we had no self-selection into jobs. So we had very little self-selection into jobs. And then managing people in the organization becomes very difficult. You see, one, one example which really stuck with me is you had... Um, you used the data or you, you had even collected the data. And I, I think Daniel Gross had collected the data on the willingness to sell of Uber drivers in Philadelphia, if I recall mm -hmm. this completely in the book. And you see so much if you read the public press or like also academic research is critical of Uber for very good reasons. There's no, no questions about it. Um, Lindsay Cameron at Wharton does fantastic work on this, for example. Um, but there's... Um, but it also shows how Uber is truly creating value for its pool of drivers, right? To say like, look, we offer you this kind of flexibility. Um, can can you give other examples, Felix, where you would, you say like, as I read the book, I couldn't help to think of, to think of academics as an example, right? Academics very often work um, in part because they like the status of universities, right? They're willing to kind of sell their services, so to speak, for less because the academic institution is offering them a certain status. Can can you kind of think of other examples in the book or outside of the book where you would say, these are companies that have successfully lowered the willingness to sell of their employees or in a, in a, put in a nicer way who create value beyond the compensation? Hmm. Yes, yeah, so... I mean, the, the example that is top of mind is, of course, when I ask CEOs what they learned as a result of the pandemic, everybody's first answer is, oh, my God, who knew how much people are interested in flexibility? Like how important flexibility is for, you know, to make people come back to work, but also to be competitive with everyone else. Now, I then usually show uh, data uh, that goes back to the late 1990s where you see the number one thing that people wanted was flexibility. So it's not as though people are quiet about what they want. They told us, they screamed at the top of their lungs that they wanted flexibility and we just didn't listen. So the, the fascinating part here is that it's, it's not that it's harder to figure out in, in many ways, it's easier to figure out because these are people inside your organization. You can just go and ask. And you know many companies do these engagement surveys where they have a good sense of what people like and what people don't like. But somehow this sort of having a differentiated value proposition that really sets the firm apart from everyone else is just not that it's just not that common so i think of uh, one of the most successful law firms uh, in the united states where the value proposition is essentially you come work for us and you're not really going to have a life you, you won't have friends you you won't you won't be able to start a family because the job at this particular law firm is all consuming and then you get the expected reaction. Some people look at it and go, oh my God, horrible. I would never, ever, ever for this work for this particular company. What are they even talking about? Like I have to be available around the clock all the time. Uh, and others look at it and say, well, you know, I don't have that many friends to begin with. And uh, they are working on the best, most complex legal problems uh, in, the, in the economy. And as a result, they get these really top candidates. So, but it's not, when you see differentiation in employee relationships, um, in, in economics, we often distinguish uh, vertical and horizontal differences. So vertical differences are differences where everybody agrees what's better and what's worse. So say a safer car is better than a car that is not so safe. 
uh, horizontal differences are differences where we don't agree. So if I make your breakfast, if I add sugar to your breakfast, maybe you'll like it, maybe you'll think it's worse. It's a little hard to say. If you see differentiation in that relationship with employees, it's almost always of the vertical sort, where we sort of agree what's better. You know, like I pay on time and I live up to my promises and, and so on and so on, all these kinds of things. But that, of course, is mostly differentiation that is not really that sustainable because it's clear what everybody has to do. Everybody agrees a firm that does that thing really well is a more attractive firm. If you have a, the kind of differentiation like the law firm that I described, where you look at it and some people will say, oh my God, this is horrible. My God, why would anyone ever? That's the kind of differentiation that ends up being really powerful. You know, what I, sorry. I, I wonder if sometimes th this goes a little bit beyond the book and probably beyond the hour, but but I wonder if this is in part kind of the fault of academia. You see, like whether you look at macro research or micro research, we have gotten so obsessed with treatment effects, right? So we, you know, like we've run all these experiments and these are always the gold standards, but so much what you're talking about the book, if you think about it, are selection effects, right? You see, like it's okay. very much about kind right. of market sorting. And so, but you see, like if I want to, if I want to kind of be successful as a researcher in a business school, I kind of want to get rid of selection effects, right? I really want to have treatment effects. So this is this goes beyond. But I, but I wonder if the emphasis why we're neglecting these kind of questions is very often a little bit kind of that they are hard to test. They, they are incredibly crucial, but they are harder to test in research. Yeah, I think that's one reason, and then maybe a practical reason is also. You see it maybe most pronounced in when when people have startups when they're early in the in the life of companies where of course you to attract financing to attract good talent uh, you tend to exaggerate how big the idea is that you have you tend to sort of oh my company can serve everyone a little bit and that thinking also doesn't really lend itself to selection effects I think then you see the really good companies. So think think about what's happened, say, in the hotel landscape where Marriott now has, I don't even know, stop counting all the brands that they have. But this is all about making sure that customers don't end up in the wrong hotel, right? So that I, as someone who doesn't pay all that much money, like I'm, I, I, I don't want to end up in the wrong hotel where then things are too expensive and I don't really appreciate all the effort and cost that goes into uh, making the experience a luxury experience. We, we're, we do such good sorting for customers. And, and frankly, why it is that in the talent space, we then don't do much sorting. And as a result, all the emphasis goes on compensation. So I, when I speak with HR professionals, like one of the things I always tell them is if in conversations with prospective employees or in conversations with people who are at the organization, if compensation is really top of mind, what that tells you to a first approximation is that your value proposition is not so differentiated from the value proposition that other companies have. And as a result, it's exactly the same as on the customer side. If I have seven companies with the same products and same services, how do I choose? I choose based on price. If I have seven companies that offer very similar jobs, no real differentiation, how do I choose? Compensation is top of mind. And so we forgo selection effects and we hurt ultimately the profitability of the firm because we choose to compete in compensation. This was an interesting aspect for me for, for the book. When I read it, a little bit of a light opened up when you said like, look, um, so many managers complain about the competition on price and what they are implicitly saying is we are not particularly differentiated, right? So you, That's right, yes. you, you complain yeah. about the environment, but actually you're blaming yourself. It's a little bit as if a CEO complains about the top management team where you need to go back and say like this. <laughs> Guess who hired these folks? Um, the, the, there's one aspect about which I think cuts broader on what strategy is. And, and it's, an, it's an anecdote in the book, which I think is incredibly funny that you have your students draw these value maps and um. like, how do you perform basically where and how you should perform? 
And so the more you are to the right, so you basically outline like 10, 15 dimensions and the better you do on towards the right on these dimensions, the better you are. And when you ask your students, um, how should this company kind of change its value proposition? You only see arrows to the right. Basically, everybody says That's you fun. should be stronger on that. You should be stronger on that. And you should be stronger on that. Um, Felix, say say a word why that is and more important, even why that is problematic. So I think why it is, is simply if you and I sit down and we're thinking about ways to create more value for customers, ways to create more value for employees. Oh my God, that's like an amazing exercise. It's so engaging. It's 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 just like imagination ultimately sits at the very heart of strategy. So we what I call the what I call value drivers, these components of willingness to pay or willingness to sell. I need to figure out novel ways how to create value. And that is something we love to do. It's engaging. It's a fabulous conversation to have. The conversation that we don't want to have is how are we going to let down customers? How are we going to disappoint the people who walk into our stores? But that's the reality of any business that you don't have infinite resources. And as a result, you can't be excellent at all of these value drivers. Uh, but because that's such an uncomfortable conversation to have, like imagine you sit in a meeting and you go, okay, so how are we going? Like, are there novel ideas for how we're going to disappoint our customers? <laughs> That's a, like everybody will look at you they're like, oh, now, uh, now you're in deep trouble. I don't know exactly what happened, but like, something's not quite right. But of course, the reality is if we want to be good at everything and we don't have the resources to be good at everything, we essentially end up in a situation where everybody is roughly the same and no one is really stand out. Uh, my colleague Francis Fry often uses this notion of exhausted mediocrity as a way to describe what happens in business. People are incredibly engaged, work very long hours. I mean, you fire off an email on a Sunday morning, it'll take like 15 seconds for you to get an answer. We have the best educated workforce in human history. How is it that not all of our companies are incredibly, incredibly successful? And the answer is no trade-offs. We're trying to do everything. We're trying to push these value maps. This is why the, 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 the arrows that go to the right, it's like, oh yeah, we're trying to improve every, on everything. And as a result, it's this crazy rat race where we're, we're running faster and faster and faster. And we don't really have much to show for it because we lack the resources to be really excellent along all of these dimensions. You see, it's interesting when that you make the, the link to Francis Fry. I was thinking of your former colleague, the late Chris, Clay Christensen, and this concept of disruptive innovation. And very much this idea, you start out with an innovation, right, which is like inferior on all dimensions, but truly superior on one. And in many ways, what these kind of disruptors do is a very courageous trade-off, right? Um, but the other companies are almost laughing them off, right? There's the famous example of Steve Ballmer laughing at the iPhone that I think there's an unwillingness to almost engage with these kind of trade-off and who is actually entering in them. Yeah. 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 It's exactly right. It's a, even with all the companies that I've worked with, I don't really think I've seen too many that are consciously saying you know, this is an element, this is a dimension along which we want to perform poorly. I think at best what happens is that you have clearly identified the two or three value drivers that are that are key to your value proposition. And then sort of everything else falls by the wayside. And, you know, budgets get cut and there's less managerial attention. The best people in the organization don't want to be associated with the value drivers that are not so important. And so over time, you have a value proposition that looks more beautiful and that is uh, more effective financially speaking. But it's just incredibly hard to have this conversation about what not to do, uh, where not to excel, where to be mediocre, the kinds of ways you're going to let down customers or the kinds of ways in which you're going to disappoint employees. That is just like the that's the reality, of course, because we don't have infinite resources. 
uh, but it's a it's a very it's a very difficult conversation to have. It's it's interesting when I so I teach entrepreneurship classes and when the when students pitch at the end, they very often compare themselves to the competition, and they're basically always superior on all dimensions. They are just trying <laughs> yeah. to we are, we yes, are better yeah. than everyone. So so basically like, like this, and what's also interesting is how how skeptical investors. So I have actual investors in the class. How investors are often very skeptical of this, and they say like, look, this mostly reveals a lack of understanding of the market. These people are not out there stupid, basically. Yes, yeah. yeah. And and yet at the same time, the financing relationship, of course, often forces people to, you know, make the idea bigger than it really yeah. is, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's as a result of how we often f uh, fund startups, it's it's actually very hard to start a mid-sized company. Like every, but because, you know, the track record of VCs in recognizing really great idea is not all that fabulous. And as a result, the industry has become to really rely on these outsized hits that can make up for all the investments that ultimately don't pan out. And I have sometimes students who, you know, they have maybe a 200 million idea. Mm -hmm. Like it is yep. incredibly difficult to attract financing for a $200 million business. And it's, it's, it's something that is not, not quite right because then it pushes people to do exactly what you say. It's like, oh, we're also the best product for this customer segment and for this part of the talent uh, for the talent pool, when in fact, if you were, if you started out more modest, I think you would have a better chance of building a sustainable business. Yeah, very much. Ben, Harvard Business Review just published an article, I believe, The Messy Middle by Ben and Ed Halen, on this very much of this idea that there's like a struggle to kind of, if you have this $200 million idea, that classical kind of venture capitalists don't go for you. Um, we've, we've, in a certain way, we have started with the book in reverse a little bit, right? We've talked quite a bit about the willingness to sell. Um, I want to feature a little bit more the willingness to pay. You have a, a, a few more beautiful ways in the book and how the willingness to pay can be increased. Can you, can you give like can the, the kind of participants like one or two more ideas on how companies succeed in increasing the willingness to pay? Yes. So there's really three levers. One obviously is the product or the service itself. So the quality that you have or the features of the of the product. And then the two things that are a little further removed or maybe a little less obvious is complements and network effects. Uh, complements are other products, other services that help lift willingness to pay of something else. And often we sort of, we almost forget how important compliments are because we get so used to them. So for instance, if I asked you, what's your willingness to pay for a car? I have no idea, like 50,000 euro, something like that. Now think about a car without compliments, no roads, no gas stations, no repair shops, no GPS. I mean, cars would just be essentially useless if we didn't have all of these compliments. And the trick to find compliments is to not, if I asked you, like, how would you increase the willingness to pay of anything, really? You're thinking about the product or the service, right? How to make the product or the service better. But the, but the compliment lives at some distance. So one of my uh, favorite European examples is, you know, I want to eat in a great restaurant somewhere in Paris. Who do I ask? I ask the people who make automobile tires. How strange is that? How on earth did Michelin start to have a guide? And it turns out, well, early automobile history in France, <laughs> all the cars are in Paris. Everybody's just making local trips. That is terrible if you're a tire manufacturer. And so they come up with the guy to encourage long trips, hoping that people will go to the restaurants in the South and hotels and elsewhere in France, using up a whole lot of tires. So, so the idea is that the compliment is not so easy to see because it's not really your business. It's something else. I tell the story of a movie theater in the book uh, that offers babysitting services. They only discovered babysitting services as a really powerful compliment after the CEO of the movie theater had kids himself. 
And all of a sudden you figured out, oh my God, I'm the CEO of a movie theater and I can't really go to the movies because arranging babysitting services is so is so hard. So the the trick in thinking about compliments is that you're 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 not thinking too closely about about your business. Think about really like what else needs to be in place for the customer so that the customer can then optimally use the products or services that you might produce. And then network effects, obviously, with social media and everything we've talked about a lot. Those are just products whose willingness to pay for these products increases with adoption. So that's obviously true in social media. It's true in electric vehicles from charging stations. It's true in gaming. When we, when we look at the very big platforms that have come to dominate at least the digital part of the economy, all of them basically built their success on this notion of the more adoption I have, the greater the greater willingness to pay. There, it's more a question of seeing, uh, yes, Amazon is really big and Microsoft is and Google, they're all really big. Are there ways to compete with the really big platforms? And there's a chapter that thinks a little bit about, what if I'm the small guy? What if I uh, happen to miss the Google train? Like, and now I have a small business. Like, what, how sh what should my relationship be with these big platforms so that I, that I can hold on? They're, they're fabulous for value creation, right? So they lift the willingness to pay of my product. It's just that they also tend to eat my lunch. And so how can I withstand that pressure if I live in the shadow of one of these big platforms? I really, yeah, you talk quite a bit about Etsy in that context, right? And how yeah. they <laughs> yes. they find ways to to delight their customers. Um, Felix, I, I would like us, we have, we have lots of questions. Um, I'm just going to channel them to you. Um, okay. We have Philip Lingard asking a question, is strategy still possible in the accelerating pace of technological advance? And then more specifically, um, how can we strategize when AI will produce apps we can scarcely imagine before Christmas this year? So the general question about technology, but maybe we start with that and then we go into the AI angle, which has come up quite a bit. Yes, yeah. So I will say the following. If, if, you, if you describe the drivers of willingness to pay in great detail, essentially it's the product that you have today, then of course that product looks different two months from now, a year from now, and so on and so on. But if you, if you describe value creation really in terms of what is it that the customer really wants? So say, take me as a bank customer. So I want to know my investments are secure, that no one has access to my funds. And I probably want the ease, the convenience with which I can do my banking transactions. Those are probably the two most important things for me. How you do convenience, of course, that will change dramatically. Uh, but the fact that I want convenience, that is not really going to change. The fact that I want the sense of my funds are secure and I, I don't have to worry about some imposter that has access to my accounts, that is not how we do uh, security, of course, will change. So this, this notion that, that strategy is not really possible in uh, technologically fast changing environment, I think is completely misguided. And it's misguided because you're thinking about, oh, uh, how exactly are we going to do the thing that will create value for the customer? It sometimes it comes back as this notion, oh, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't really pay attention to customers. Customers don't really know what they want. And it's related to Ford and Steve Jobs. And, and it's complete nonsense. I mean, customers don't know how to create a safe banking account. That, of course, is right. Uh, that is your job to figure out with all the technological possibilities that we have today. How do I, how do I secure these accounts? Uh, but the security that they, they know what they want. And it's your job to figure out how to do this better. If you, if you make the mistake of of changing how you create value very often. What you will see is that in companies that do this very often, the next reaction to the next strategic change, everybody in the organization is gonna go duck because you know, it's just for two weeks. It's just for two months. It's just for a year. Why would I wanna be engaged? Why would I wanna expend every effort? If I know you say this, 
today and then you say something completely different tomorrow. It's interesting. The, the question by Philip made me think of an academic paper by, by Hart Posen and then Leventhal. And they basically point out if, if the environment becomes very turbulent, there your intuition is that you want to explore a lot, but what they actually show is actually it suddenly becomes very good to just basically exploit enormously. You focus on the value proposition because the learning you get from kind of additional exploration is basically like immediately meaningless. So you basically try to become very much better at what you do. So yeah. um, you see, in that sense, you become more focused on the value proposition you create, right? And then you think about how you can leverage these technologies you have in using the work by Anderson and Tuchman, right? Like you make it hopefully like value enhancing in a certain way. Um, yeah. Felix, say, say a word about AI. This must come up a lot in your classes. <laughs> really? No, I never get questions about AI. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I one of the things that I that I love to do is I I show people um, productivity total factor productivity in in every large economy you can look at uh, going back to the early 1990s and the striking thing is it's very clear you see the business cycle so productivity goes up and down with the business cycle you see no trace of the internet you see no trace of the digitization of the economy and so the question is. How on earth is that even possible? We do things so differently now from the way we've done things even like five minutes ago. How is it that none of this shows up in productivity? And uh, I think there's two important ideas. One is we, we sometimes, uh, as a result of technological advances, really just shift the bottleneck. I don't know if this happens to you, but I guess I'm getting like half the email I receive is now uh, is now AI generated, and and I can in part I can tell because all of these email messages are very long. Uh, they're longer than you would care to type if you really had to type it out yourself. Uh, and they're very they're very they're, the English is beautiful and and the, but they're very detailed. So now all you've done is you shifted the bottleneck from writing email to now me sitting here and reading your long stories about you know something that I maybe should pay attention to. So so that's a that's an important thing to think about. The other thing to think about is why, how can it be that productivity doesn't move? Well, it could be that we're producing much more output, but the value of that output has decreased dramatically. Prices have fallen. And this is already, I don't know oh, how closely you follow the situation in China. There is a brutal price war among people who provide uh, chat GPT like products. Really like it. it is almost inconceivable that many of these companies will ever make money. And so but the question is like, okay, so yes, technology will change things in particular ways, but can we do we really believe there's a there's a source of differentiation that is somehow allows people to capture a fraction of the value? Or is it just that? You know, it's really great for consumers because things are easier and things are more convenient. But actually, from a company perspective, all of that excitement around AI and Gen AI and everything that's associated with it, do we really do we really believe that there's a handful of companies that can do it much better than anyone else? And if we do so, so if you make, say, the argument, oh, but you need these huge models that are little, like hundreds of millions of dollars to train. Then, of course, the question is, yes, I understand fixed cost can often be a very significant barrier to entry. But what does that imply for the size of the business? If, if the barrier to entry and profitability reflects significant fixed cost, isn't that like, and you might remember uh, those predictions, we're all going to have 3D printers in our kitchen. Remember that? And yeah. then that never happened. Why? Oh, it's not that 3D printing doesn't work. It's just too expensive for most applications that we've been able to come up with. And so then the question is, oh, if this is a fixed cost game so that we get a few companies and the companies can be really profitable, then of course the big question is how big is that business really? There's an interesting line of work now on AI because in, in a certain way of thinking about it is right, it lowers the cost of cognition. And people have actually kind of compared now the calories it takes to feed the human brains compared to like the kilowatts. 
it kind of takes to train and update an AI model. And so it turns out these AI models are from that angle incredibly inefficient, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, so it lowers in some aspects the cost of cognition, but not that dramatic or not as, as, as crucial as one might as one might think. Um Lisa Lotte has a question completely different. And I, I, I read the question, but I would love to almost broaden it a little bit further. Um, she asked, how do you consider and balance the value creation to broader stakeholders as sustainability implies, including climate change for the planet? Let's start with that, and maybe then we can get a bit broader. Yeah. So there's the, the last chapter in the book is exactly is exactly Lisa's question. And I think it's incredibly important. One thing to think about is if if strategy is about value creation, the usual corporate claims that, oh, we're not just in it for investors. We also create value for customers and we create value for employees. We have a stakeholder model. That tells me nothing because even if you're just thinking about profitability, your best course of action is to create value for customers and is to create value for employees. So then I want to see evidence that you are more generous with customers than competition forces you to be to begin with, or that you're more generous with employees than competition for talent forces you to be. Uh, to, to be it. Uh, and at the same time, you want then to think about, okay, so if we have these stakeholder oriented organizations and more generous with employees and more generous with customers, what is it that the corporate sector can do? And what is it that the government needs to do? And one really important point that I make towards the end of the book is if the prices are wrong, the corporate sector has no chance of getting it right. So most obvious with carbon, the price of carbon is way too low. So even if I, as a company, want to be really generous with my customers, really generous with my employees, I'm still going to be wasteful in ways that don't reflect the incredible cost of climate change. So there's no private sector solution to having the wrong prices because prices ultimately are the signals that tell companies where to invest and the kinds of activities to develop. So the the there 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 is a stakeholder world in the sense that we can when we think about dividing up value, why should so say make a practical example? So say I'm a company, my cost of capital is is ten percent, and but I my returns are eighteen percent, uh, my return on invested capital. Why is it that the extra eight percent should go to the owners of the firm? That's not at all obvious. Maybe maybe we would create the most good if the extra return goes to higher salaries for employees. Maybe the extra return should go to people who want to, I don't know, study or whatever whatever it is that they want to do. So so I'm I'm completely in sync with this sort of stakeholder idea. Let's think flexibly about how value that's created is being allocated. Just thinking about we can never charge customers more than their willingness to pay. We can never pay employees less than their willingness to sell. And we can never pay investors less than their cost of capital, right? So those are the constraints. Those constraints are binding for roughly half the firms. So not that many, I mean, half the firms have some flexibility, half the firms don't. Uh, but then if you have flexibility, yes, by all means, believe in a stakeholder model. Can we can we use that as a way to deal with climate change? No, we cannot, because climate change is an issue of not seeing the true cost of using energy and so on and so on. Um, Palatonel asks the question, do you see strategy as a top-down exercise or do you have good examples of a bottom-up approach? Mm, I would say choosing these value drivers that is, I mean, you could involve lots of people, outside experts, but ultimately that's probably a top leadership conversation and then a determination, which of the two or three value drivers are really at the center of the organization. But then the, the millions of ideas, the imagination that goes into thinking, and how do we move these value drivers in a really cost-effective way? That can be incredibly collaborative. I think, in fact, 
when I, I visit many companies because I write I write lots of cases. And uh, I always make it a point to talk to the CEO and the CFO at the very end. And then, you know, I'm all fired up because I've seen all of these amazing things. And I go to their office and say, oh, my God, it's incredible what you're doing. And most of the time, they have no idea. They don't even really know. Why? Because they, if they did it right, they defined a couple of value drivers that are really central. And then it's everyone's job to think about, oh, can we actually move the firm? Can we move these value drivers in a particular fashion? So it's, a, I know this sounds like a cop-out answer, but it's a little bit of both. You you have to be super specific and clear about the value drivers. Otherwise, if you you know, this is the problem of suggestion boxes, right? So if you just have a suggestion box, you get you get suggestions that will pull the firm in a million different directions. And then you're in the uncomfortable situation that you have to say no all the time. And people will say, well, so why did you put up that suggestion box if you're going to say no all the time? So there is real value in being super specific about what these value drivers are. But then really open and collaborative when it comes to what are the best ideas? The best, it will be so surprising if the top management team had the best ideas how to, how to move value drivers. It's it's interesting, Philip, uh, Felix. I, I didn't think of it as a cop out at all. It, it so I've done quite a bit of research on crowdsourcing, and obviously Karim Lakhani, yeah. Mike Tushman have worked on this. I was I was thinking of Hila Lifshitz's dissertation at HBS and how she describes how people have gone gone from like problem owners to solution seekers in a certain way, right? So you're you're kind of making the call for ideas by setting these values, right? So you're you're setting up the overarching value. Um, and and then you have these kind of ideas pop up. Um, Wood has asked my absolute favorite question, and so I wanna mm -hmm. I wanna end with that. Um, we have to answer them both. Um, but I let you start. Um, he writes here in proper after hour style. Any recommendations? <laughs> I know for, for people who don't know, um, the beauty of the after hours podcast is that at the end, there's often a recommendation. It can be some Turkish recipe. It can be some music. Um, it can be like a, some device, some electronic device. Sometimes my favorite was an accessory to an accessory to an accessory, where you actually recommended like some box for the airports, which were itself an accessory. <laughs> um, any recommend, I know this is not prepared, Felix, but maybe you have some recommendation beyond obviously and um, buying the book, Better Simpler Strategy. Anything else, Felix, you would like to share with the audience? <laughs> this is very funny and, and uh, a little unexpected. So so as you probably know from the from the podcast, I, I love to cook. And uh, at the same time, I'm sort of wedded to this idea of making things as simple as possible. And uh, I received a, a cookbook as a gift uh, not so long ago. Um, it's written by uh, Eric Repair, the, the the famous chef who is uh, has uh, this Le, Le Bernardin restaurant in New York City, and it is simply called Seafood Simple, and it's a delicious, fabulous set of set of recipes. See, he he wrote an earlier book on on vegetables, which I don't know if I love that that much. That was maybe a little too simple. But this is just absolutely brilliant. Like if you if you love fish and if you love cooking, uh, highly recommend it. My recommendation is twofold. Obviously, by the by Felix book, it's absolutely excellent. Um, better, simpler strategy. It's available on all kind of major platforms. I have the audiobook, I have the Kindle, and I have the printed version. <laughs> um, so even if you already own a copy, maybe buy like a second one. They are all fantastic in their own way. One thing I forgot to mention, by the way, I love the visuals. I don't know if you did the visuals yourself. The visuals are absolutely beautiful. Um, I had help. Yes. Yeah. So uh, HBS Publishing had someone who's really talented. Oh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Otherwise, of course, I recommend um, the um, the next webinar. I believe it's 11 days from now on June 29th, but I have to look it up. It's with Scott Page, who's the leading researchers for organizations and complexity. Um, wow. He's a professor at Michigan. He's absolutely fantastic. He's written best-selling books um, on diversity, on how to think like a modeler. 
Um, so I think it's going to be an amazing talk. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to this. And then um, I recently have a typical way of ending these talks and I get complaints if I don't. So I'm going to go with my usual. Um, there are 400,000 thought leaders on LinkedIn, but just one Henning Pizunker. So please follow me on LinkedIn. All right. Um, on that note, Felix, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, this was a blast. And in the names of everyone, please give us more after hours kind of podcast. We are eager to hear. <laughs> thank you so much for the invitation, Henning. It was a thank real so pleasure much. to be here. Bye. Bye-bye.